Hello all Royal Rangers, my name is Commander Matthew Kenslow and I'm over here in the United States of America and I've been a Royal Ranger for 20 years and year number 7 as a commander. Thank you so much for checking out this video. The purpose of this video is to go over a merit. In these videos I'm going to walk through every one of the requirements. Now it's important to note that while watching these videos it will not give you the merit. You have to show to your commander that you have watched and learned from these videos. What I recommend you doing is taking down notes for each requirement and then show them to your commander for approval. Some of the purposes of Royal Rangers is to build knowledge, wisdom, skills, and leadership attributes while learning about God's word and conserving his resources practically. And most importantly, to have fun doing it. So I'm Commander Matthew Kenslow from the United States of America and be blessed. Hi everybody, welcome to the Forestry Merit. Let's begin with requirement one. Describe the contributions forests make to the following. Our economy in the form of products, soil protection and increased fertility, clean water, clean air, wildlife, recreation. So I suggest that you write these down and as you watch through this merit, take notes on these six things I invite you, of course, to do extra research uh, beyond this to fill in some more gaps. But you could do most of this requirement, if not all of it, if you pay attention and take notes. So let's go on to requirement two. Diagram and label the parts of a tree. You have the trunk. The trunk supports the primary branches. The primary branches support the secondary branches. And so on and so forth until you get to the twigs. So it's kind of a bit like our lungs, only upside down. Um, air enters our mouth and our nose, goes to uh, the windpipe or the trachea, which goes to our lungs. You have the bronchi, and then that branches off into secondary bronchi and tertiary, and so on until it gets to very small bronchioles. Well, likewise, in a tree, we have the trunk, and then it branches off into uh, the primary branch. So the primary branch branches off from the trunk, the secondary branch branches off from the primary, and so on and so forth until you get to the twigs. The trunk also supports the upper part of the tree and provides a pipeline for the nutrients. All of these together form the crown of the tree. So everything above ground, all the leaves, the branches, the twigs, form the crown. The crown refers to the total of the plant's above ground parts, including stems and leaves. And the leader is the vertical stem up at the top of the trunk, right here. And then you have the flare. The flare is where the trunk meets the roots and is the broadening of the trunk right above the soil line. Broadening means widening. Feeder roots collect water and minerals from the soil. From spring until fall, the feeder roots push ever outward by as much as an inch a day. The larger roots carry these nutrients to the trunk of the tree where they are taken to the branches and leaves. The lateral roots form a mat as much as four feet deep for some trees. They stay near the surface to obtain oxygen and moisture for the tree. The taproot supports the tree and is sent down to anchor the tree. Taproots are braced by the, by the roots around its base. The taproot starts out in a young tree as both the anchor and feeder. As the tree matures, the taproot becomes the anchor alone. And it's not just big trees, but also vegetables. Do you know that when you eat carrots, that's essentially the taproot? For some more trivia, when you eat potatoes, that's part of the stem of the plant. The roots of the tree may spread out three times as far as the branches. You have the crown. Okay, imagine the width of the crown. The roots can spread out to about three times the width of the crown. Um, so I liken it to the tree being the tip of the iceberg. 
and a lot of it is underneath the ground, what we can't see. In order to effectively care for trees, the total surface of the tree must equal the total surface area of the roots, and that's why when roots are lost in transplanting, some leaf-bearing branches must be pruned. Anyway, uh, to say the least, simply put, trees are amazing. A 40-foot tree sucks 50 gallons of nutrients from the surrounding soil and lifts these liquefied minerals to the leaves through a series of small pipe-like channels. While the liquid is in the leaves, the tree transforms it into 10 pounds of carbohydrate food and releases into the air about 60 cubic feet of pure oxygen. Those are pretty much the products of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is how the tree makes food, quote unquote. It sucks up the moisture from the ground, the water, um, specifically from the soil through the roots, up the xylem, um, which are the part of the tissues of the vascular system of the plants, and then it uses the sunlight, the CO2 in the air, and it takes all that together to form glucose, which is a carbohydrate, and releases oxygen, uh, which we humans and animals, etc., breathe in. So without trees, there may not be an adequate source of, of oxygen because oxygen is produced in the leaves of the tree. A plant community canopy consists of one or more plant crowns growing in a given area. So in other words, you have all these trees, they each have a crown, which remember are um, is everything above ground, including all the branches and all the leaves. And when you have a bunch of crowns put together, you have a canopy. Forests cover approximately 30% of our planet. Okay, requirement three. Explain the steps involved in planting and caring for a tree. First, here are the reasons to plant a tree. Privacy. To reduce soil erosion, which we'll talk about later. For a winter windbreak. In other words, um, when the wind comes, uh, the trees will help block the wind or sort of break the wind along its path. For summer cooling to reduce air pollution. So trees absorb pollutant gases such as ammonia, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and ozone. Trees can trap small particles from the air on their bark and leaves. To increase property value, trees do add a value or cost to property. For a wildlife habitat, for landscape design, for a site or sound barrier, for fruit, and for lumber, timber, um, and such to build with, or for firewood. So wood is used as a commodity. What to consider when planting a tree? One is site. Choose a site that has good soil, water, and light conditions, and gives the tree plenty of room to grow. Watch out for buried utility lines, as well as water lines. 2. Tree Selection. Select a tree species that will thrive at the site you have chosen. Kind of like when you're um, buying seeds from a, a certain store, uh, maybe like Home Depot for example, and the package of the seeds kind of tells you okay, the best places in North America to, to plant it at, um, the best season or month to plant it in. It gives you that in the in the direction, so you want to select a tree species that will thrive in your area. Quality. Know what to look for when purchasing a tree. Transportation and storage. Know how to safely transport the tree to your site and store it for a, for a short period of time until you are ready to transplant it. Planting and care. Know how to properly plant and care for the tree in order to give the tree the greatest chance of survival. So here are the steps to planting a tree. Step 1 is select the site for a tree. Is it far away from overhead power lines and buried utility lines as well as uh, water lines? Uh, notice that uh, these people are planting the tree far from these telephone lines that you see 
uh, behind them in the background. Is it large enough for the roots of the tree to spread out? Remember, the roots grow up to three times wider than the branches. Does it have good soil? Is the soil too sandy? Is the soil a clay soil that holds water too long? Is the pH between 5.5 and 7.0? And we'll talk about what pH is later. Is the soil too easily compacted? Are there about 30 inches of good soil? So these are questions that you want to uh, ask yourself when selecting the site for a tree. Uh, just to say, um, I might as well add now, what is the difference between soil and just dirt or sand? Well, sand or dirt are just crushed rock and they get underneath the, the, the fingernails and such. Well, soil is different. It's composed of both organic and inorganic material. It is composed of decaying plant and animal remains. Um, it has, you know, biotic factors, which means living factors, the, uh, the bugs that are inside the soil to, uh, to, to help enrich the soil. Uh, water, minerals, so like um, elements that you could uh, find on the periodic table. Uh, that's all part of soil. So it's more than just like sand and dirt and rock. Step two, select a tree for your site. How tall and wide will the tree become in 10 and 50 years? How fast will it grow? What shape will it be? Can the tree tolerate the soil? Are there many of the same trees in the area? Is the tree able to survive the climate? So here's a, a graphic that I found, kind of a bit similar to this one right here, um, but really briefly, um, just take a look at this graphic right here. Uh, you notice that small trees are planted right here. The, um, this is the width, about like 20, 30 feet uh, that some of the trees these small or medium trees can can grow to. You notice that if you have a power line or, or more like a telephone pole that has power lines on it, um, you don't want the trees to grow that tall. Um, but you could allow taller trees to grow uh, further away from uh, from the power line or the telephone pole. And so here's another graphic. Uh, you also want to make sure that the the tree is uh, safe. Of course, from uh, from like falling down, you don't want a tree that would fall down on a house. So make sure that you are uh, very careful about that. In September of 2011, when I was a junior in high school, we had a tragedy in the neighborhood. There was a row of eucalyptus trees uh, down Irvine Avenue in Newport Beach, California. I was in the library, and all of a sudden there were um, a, an earthquake sound of a helicopter flying overhead. That's how uh, fast the helicopter was going. Then it went over again. And then I heard the library, or the librarians, you know, laughing amongst themselves saying, oh my gosh, there is a tree that fell on a car down the street. And so I go outside and I go by the, the football field and I see a helicopter, probably medevac helicopter, in our field at my high school, Newport Harbor High School. And um, later, I we walked over there and by the time I got there I had seen the blue car that was just crushed because the eucalyptus tree fell on top of it and um, it was just being towed away by the time I got there but unfortunately the lady inside ended up dying and you know she was a very accomplished musician I believe she went to Juilliard and she was on her way of, of um, teaching children if I remember correctly or, or teaching some class and um, but it, it was a tragedy um, a tree specialist or an arborist came over um, to kind of give his uh, thoughts of why this may have happened um, but something that did happen after that is they cut down all those eucalyptus trees just in case so just something to to keep in mind when uh, about trees making make sure that you uh, pay close attention and in, in, um, caring for them and keep in mind about again like how tall they could uh, they could grow and what type of tree is it deciduous which means that it sheds its leaves annually or is it evergreen which means that it has uh, green leaves all year round and and such and then you have some uh, examples like maple holly magnolia 
you have trees, uh, small trees that are both, uh, or that could be deciduous or evergreen. And it has some suggestions, like you want maybe this type of shade tree uh, to provide shade for the house in the summer. Um, this tree is good probably for privacy year-round. Um, this tree um, is okay to be planted closer to the to the house. And also don't forget the, the roots. You don't want the roots to be uh, growing and basically messing with the foundation of the house or the house itself. Okay, step three is purchase a tree. Is there an adequately sized root ball? First of all, what is that? This is a root ball right here, and we'll get to that later. The root ball should be 10 to 12 times the diameter of the trunk. Are the roots healthy, not obviously crushed or torn? Is the trunk free from mechanical wounds or wounds from improper pruning? Does the tree have a good, strong form with branches evenly spaced along the trunk and strong attachments to the trunk? Step four is transporting a tree. Now, number one, I know this is a Christmas tree and the roots were cut off, so there's like no way to um, to maintain this tree forever um, after that. But um, but just to make a point, use a large enough vehicle to ensure that the tree will not be damaged during transport. Gently wrap the leaves or needles to protect them from the wind or sun. And you can see that with these light colored bands tied around it. Cushion the stem and branches and tie the tree down securely. And those are like the orange ropes that you see. Uh, these are probably the trucker's hitch, which you may have learned in, in Discovery Rangers for rope craft. Avoid traveling at high speeds regardless. Uh, you don't really want a, a, a tree to be inside someone else's car without opening the door for it. And um, that would also make uh, them and the attorneys a bit angry, so uh, don't do that. Uh, just uh, travel at a steady speed. If at all possible, plant immediately. If that is not possible, keep the roots moist and store it away from direct exposure to the wind and sun. And I couldn't resist to add this picture here, which I'm sure that we do not recommend, but um, hey, you could transport it by bicycle if you're strong enough. <laughs> okay, and step five is actually planting the tree. Dig a hole wide enough for the roots to grow diagonally, at least two to three times as wide as the root ball. Plant the tree at the right depth. So under normal conditions, Root growth is best encouraged by planting the tree even with the surrounding terrain. When wet conditions or heavy soil are problems, raising about one-third of the root ball above the ground will aid the spread of lateral roots. In arid or dry climates, a basin can be used to collect precious water. Make sure that the tree is straight in the hole before backfilling. And step six is care for a tree. If staking is necessary, use two stakes and a wide flexible tie material to reduce the chance of injuring the tree. Place mulch, which is decaying leaves, bark, or compost that spread around the plant at the base of the tree. Place the mulch two to four inches deep and three to four feet out. Do not put the mulch right next to the trunk. The purpose of mulch is to either enrich the soil or insulate the soil, or provide nutrients too. And keep the soil moist but not soaked. Water the tree once a week, but more frequently during hot weather, because hotter weather usually correlates to it being more dry. And also uh, pruning. So pruning is basically trimming a tree or, or some plant by uh, cutting away some um, unnecessary branches, maybe it, uh, there's overgrowth, uh, maybe there's uh, stems that are dead, dying, or diseased, um, and that's basically to increase the the uh, the fruitfulness or, or the growth of certain plants. Okay, requirement four is explain how to tell the age of a tree. Discuss the possible causes for variations in growth when examining the cross-cut section of a stump or a log. So now we're getting into tree rings, which you probably heard of. Uh, just to say, not every tree 
produces such rings, but others do. The heartwood is the oldest wood of the tree. It is no longer used to transport water. Rather, its purpose is to form a central column to support the tree. Organic matter fills up its cell walls, turning it a darker color. So you have the pith right in the middle, which is like that original stem you could think of. And then um, as the tree grows and matures, it grows outward. Okay, it's, it's that uh, broadening or, or widening. And you have the heartwood uh, right here, which is usually darker. Um, and again, it's made up of dead cells clogged with gums and resins. The sapwood transports sap from the roots to the leaves. The sap is made up of water and minerals, so that's what sap is, and that's between the heartwood and the cambium layer. The cambium layer is the growing part of the trunk. It annually produces new bark and new wood. The current year's growth is the ring next to the cambium layer, just inside the bark. And um, so again, the cambium is a very thin layer that is only one cell thick, and its task is to manufacture growing cells from spring until frost. So again, it's the, the, the growing layer. It's what's been grown, uh, grown outward every growing season. And then the bark wraps the trunk of the tree with a protective overcoat in several layers. Just beneath the bark is the phloem, which is a fibrous moist sleeve that moves nutrients from the leaves to the rest of the tree. So you have two main um, vessels. You have the xylem and phloem, and those are tissues of the trees. I mean, just like us humans, which is an organism, have all of these organ systems and, and you know, cells, tissues, organs, and such. Likewise, uh, plants have cells, tissues, and organs, including its own vascular system, kind of bit like our, um, our cardiovascular system. Um, for instance, the xylem is what transports waters uh, from the roots upward to the leaves, and the phloem carries things like sugars downward from the leaves. So if you've taken a look at that GIF, that basically says that as the trees grow taller, then their trunks grow outward and therefore more rings. Trees form new wood in the spring and summer, which are the growth seasons only. And yeah, sometimes fall, according to my research. So spring, summer, and perhaps fall. Dendrochronology is the scientific study of tree rings, which we'll get to right now. The rapid spring growth is lighter colored than the growth made in the summer, as well as thicker. Light and dark colored rings together make one year's growth. So if you take a look here, here's the pith, and then what's the dark part called? This is called the heartwood. And then what's this part called? The lighter colored part? It's called the sapwood. And then you have the cambium, which is the, the current year's uh, growing part of the wood. But overall, you see that you have the light color bands and the dark color bands. And the light color bands are thicker uh, relative to the dark color bands right here. The thicker ones represent spring and early summer growth and the thinner ones represent late summer and fall growth when the growing of the tree is slower. Here's another uh, picture uh, to explain. So in the first year, um, or let's go to the tenth year, the tree is this thick. But as um, the decades go on, the trunk widens and widens because the tree is growing. And each year, you're going to get these tree rings for a lot of the tree species. And it's more or less a record. I mean, you could read this like a, like a record book, but more on that here very shortly. When rainfall levels are low, tree rings are very narrow because the tree was not able to grow outward very much. And that's because trees, like any plants, need water. Um, just like we humans, we need water too. Well, trees and other plants, they need water for their growth. And if there's not a lot of rainfall, then there's not going to be a lot of growth. So the thinner lines like these right here um, represent years. So this, like if I'm highlighting one, two, three, these three years, uh, there wasn't adequate rainfall in this particular forest. Um, but 
this one right here, this thick one, is uh, a year that had quite a rainy season, as you can see right here. You could almost read tree rings like a topographical map that you probably learned in Compass, but not quite, but almost. It's, it's like, you know, the lines that are close together represent um, the steepness of, of the mountain and the train, but uh, not quite, but that's what it always reminds me of. If rainfall in a particular growth season was high, then those rings are thicker, as I just highlighted over here. Other factors that can affect ring thickness include the amount of growing space, soil condition, insect attacks, and fire. Uh, this is a scar from a forest fire in this particular year that you could see in some tree rings. Thin trees in Alaska do not necessarily mean they're young. Trees grow slower in cold climates, leading to less dense wood and close-packed rings. One of my commanders uh, that I uh, taught this alongside with had spent time in Alaska, and he told the adventure rangers this about trees in Alaska, and you're, you're going to see these very thin trees, but if you take a cross-section of the tree and look at the rings, there is a whole lot of rings. I mean, you, you might see like 40, 50-year-old trees that are as thin as a Christmas tree, and you know the the layers are are as thin as toilet paper as he describes it as. I personally as a scientist also believe that it's uh, because of the cold climate because stemming off from kinetic molecular theory when things are fast that means it has a lot more energy than uh, slow ones and usually in hotter environments things are faster things move fast because when you apply heat to something the molecules inside start to move fast versus um, versus cold. That would um, lead to slow growth in uh, my intuition. And think about it, if you're outside and it's freezing cold outside, don't you move slower anyway because it's very cold? And here's a microscopic image of tree rings. You see you have uh, the, the spring, summer uh, growing season, and then you have the late summer, perhaps fall growing season, and then the next year's um, growth and, and so on, so that's pretty neat. Okay, let's practice. How old was this tree, and was it older than you? Press pause if you need to. Well, let's count here from the pith. Now, how I learned how to count rings, uh, this would be uh, year one, then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, the cambium layer. So approximately 11 years old. Um, there's um, different people that, that may say different uh, things to, to count, but it's approximately 11. What do the outer light colored rings tell us about the rainfall in those years in general? Well, there was a lot of rainfall. You could see that right here, especially in the middle and outward, that there was uh, plenty of rainfall in these years. What season did the dark colored rings grow in? The dark colored rings here. Summer or early fall? How fast or slow did the light colored rings grow? Rapidly. So light colored rings grow rapidly and then uh, the dark colored rings grow slowly. Were there any important events that happened during its life? Let's take a look right here. Fire. So again, uh, looking at a tree, you could tell the history of the environment. If you know the year it was cut down, you could um, you could say, for instance, if this is 2021, you could say, okay, this is the year 2020, 2019, 2018, and so on. And we could see what happened in these years. Like, was there rainfall? Was there not a lot of rainfall? Was there forest fire, etc.? Okay, now let's move on to requirement five. Explain how trees prevent soil erosion. First of all, what is weathering? Weathering is the breakdown of rocks by physical, chemical, or biological means. What is erosion? Erosion is the movement of rock and sand by wind or water. So essentially, weathering is the breakdown of big rocks and then those little pieces of rocks, when they move, either by wind or water, 
that is called erosion. Here's some examples of soil erosion. You can see that uh, there used to be soil along inside here, inside these ruts here, and then uh, of course this probably used to be a hill right over here, but then uh, erosion basically moved or displaced part of the land away, and those are examples of soil erosion, but how could trees prevent this? Well, remember what the root ball is? It's this right here. Uh, it's basically a, a ball of soil with the roots interlaced, holding strongly uh, to the soil. Uh, here's a large root ball of a tree that you could see here. So you could see that if you pluck out a tree or a plant, it's going to carry a lot more than just the roots. It's going to carry soil with it. It holds the soil strongly. So the roots hold the soil. The lateral roots, which are near the surface of the soil, help keep the soil from being washed away by water runoff. And that's how trees prevent soil erosion. The tree's roots hold the soil. So here's a classic science experiment. Here we have a jug of just soil. Here we have some soil with dead leaves on top of it. And he, here you have soil with some plant life on it. Like it looks like you have a faucet here. Um, so let's say that you turn on the water and then fill this jug. Well, what's going to come out? Well, it's going to come out dirty water with a lot of soil particles inside uh, because there's nothing holding the soil. The water is just going to carry the soil uh, with it as it, um, as it fills and then um, uh, comes out of here and fills into there. Uh, what about this one? What do you think about this one? Well, a little bit of soil comes out with the water. Okay, finally, what about this one? Well, it's going to be clear, or relatively clear. And that's because that as the water moves about through this, and then comes out of here, it's not going to carry much or any of the soil uh, with it, because the roots of these plants are holding the soil in place. So that's... Uh, like a science demonstration to show how uh, trees prevent soil erosion. Okay, requirement six. List ten animals that depend on the forest for their food and shelter. Describe where one of these animals lives and what it eats. So I'm going to go over ten animals and describe uh, briefly about them. Uh, you're, you could feel free to research more animals or you could take one or a couple of the animals that I'm mentioning and then do further research on it. So let's start with a spring peeper. This is a frog that lives in eastern North America. It can climb into trees and bushes using its well-developed adhesive toe pads, feeding mainly on small spiders and insects, including insects that fly. The spring peeper lays its eggs in the water up to a thousand at a time. The eggs hatch in a few days as tadpoles and leave the pond three months later as frogs. The spring peeper is dependent on the forest for food, such as insects and spiders, and also to have water so that it can reproduce. Okay, the wild turkey. The wild turkey has a lighter, slimmer body and longer legs than the domesticated version. Wild turkeys are strong flyers for a short distance. They roost in trees and depend on the trees to protect them from their predators. They eat plant matter like seeds, nuts, and berries, as well as insects and small reptiles. The female lays her eggs in a shallow, leaf-lined nest on the ground. The 8 to 15 eggs hatch in about 28 days. Wild turkeys are dependent on the forest for food, protection, and shelter. Turkeys live east of the Mississippi River, and on the west coast of the United States. In fact, uh, Benjamin Franklin proposed to have the turkey as the national country's bird instead of the eagle, but we got the eagle. Okay, the porcupine. The porcupine is slow and clumsy, but will climb trees to feed on buds, twigs, and bark. 
It also eats roots and stems of flowering plants and some crops. After a gestation of seven months, the young, usually only one, is born in the late spring. It is well developed at birth, with fur, open eyes, and soft quills that harden within an hour. Shortly after birth, the young porcupine can climb trees and feed on solid food. Porcupines live in most parts of the United States and do not hibernate. White-tailed deer. The white-tailed deer feeds on grasses, weeds, shrubs, twigs, fungi, nuts, and lichens. It is able to adapt to many different climates. It is found from near the Arctic Circle to near the equator. White-tailed deer are shy and elusive, although in the breeding season the males engaged in savage battles over mates. They rely on the forest to provide food and shelter from the wind during the cold winter. Raccoon. The raccoon is a highly adaptable animal. It can be found in a city scavenging for food. Raccoons are good climbers and can swim. Uh, there was one time a few years ago, actually several years ago, when there was like a raccoon at our outpost um, for a time. Their diet consists of frogs, fish, rodents, birds, turtle eggs, nuts, seeds, fruits, and corn. Although it is found outside the forest areas, like in a city or our Royal Ranger outpost, <laughs> the raccoon does best in the forest where there is abundant food and trees to climb. The raccoon is found throughout the United States and southern Canada. The Great Horn Owl. Owls are one of my favorite birds, just to say. The Great Horn Owl roosts in trees. It will also make its nest in a tree, a cave, the hollow of a tree, or on a rock ledge. It hunts mainly at night and catches mammals up to the size of cats. It also feeds on birds, insects, and reptiles. Because it has not adapted well to being around people, it relies on the forest for protection. And you could read, I believe, Genesis 9-2 to uh, explain uh, that last paragraph there. The deer mouse. Deer mice live in the bush, moving in and out with ease. They have underground nests made up of dry vegetation and move their nest several times a year. They eat about equal amounts of plants and animal matter. They live throughout the United States, relying on the forest, grasslands, and shrubs for protection from predators. The Common Garter Snake This is found throughout the United States except in the desert regions. Its diet consists of frogs, toads, salamanders, and small invertebrates. It thrives in areas where there is damp vegetation. It is active and hunts during the day. Although it is not totally dependent upon the forest, it is much more likely to survive in the damp forested area. The Cardinal The male cardinal is a brilliant red, while the female is light brown. It is an aggressive bird that feeds on seeds and berries on the ground and in trees. Its nest is the branch of a small tree or bush in the tangle of foliage and vines. The cardinal is found in the eastern part of the United States, from the Great Lakes to New England, south to the Gulf Coast, and also in South Texas and Arizona. The cardinal is the state bird for several states, just to say. The cardinal is dependent upon the forest for protection of its nest. Okay, now the black bear. The black bear lives in the wilder, uninhabited areas of the United States and in national parks. It eats fruit, berries, nuts, roots, and honey, as well as insects and other small mammals and dead animals. The black bear depends on the forest to protect it from its chief predator, humans. So what I learned when I was younger is that black bears are the most uh, scared, like um, loud noises would uh, make them flee. I've also heard that uh, bears like the grizzly bear are very, very fast that you can't outrun them. My fifth grade teacher at Newport Heights Elementary, he biked all around Alaska and he saw a lot of grizzly bears and told us his stories of, of how fast they were. Um, for some bears, um, don't try to climb a tree if you 
have to escape from a bear because bears are excellent uh, tree climbers. And um, the black bear specifically is native to America, so uh, the uh, taxonomical term or species actually is Ursus americanus. The grizzly bear, just for some trivia, is Ursus arctos horribles. Um, horribles is specifically the subspecies of the brown bear. So a grizzly bear is a brown bear, uh, but it's a, a subspecies of the brown bear, which is Ursus arctos. And then you have Ursus maritimus, which are the polar bears, and a couple of other species of bears throughout uh, the world. So um, quite interesting. Ursa or Ursae is Latin for bear, like Ursa Major, which is the big bear constellation, and Ursa Minor, which is the little bear constellation. And I say all that because I sort of studied bears and a bit of their taxonomy here several, uh, or about three or four years ago. Well, anyway, to summarize everything, the forest and all the animals that live in the forest depend on each other to maintain healthy animals and plants, like we've um, just uh, went through. We've went through ten of them, and we saw how they depended on the forest. Forests provide natural habitats for over 80% of land animals and plants. Okay, requirement seven. This is something that you'll do on your own. It says, study ten trees or shrubs native to your state. One should be your state tree. Submit a notebook that includes the following for each species. A photo or drawing of the tree or shrub. A sketch of a leaf or branch of the tree or shrub. A sketch of its seed or an explanation of how the plant reproduces. A list of the uses of the tree or shrub by mankind or wildlife. So here's an example of, of something that your commander will be looking for. Uh, a picture drawing of a tree, in this case the white oak, and uh, you see uh, uh, like a sketch of the leaf of the white oak, and the white oak uh, bears acorns here. And then underneath uh, you just put like the uses of the white oak right down here. Okay, finally requirement eight. Describe the damage to forest that result from, we're starting with wildfire. Wildfire may endanger property or lives. Foresters may lose control of a forest fire and burn more than is healthy for the forest. Fires are sometimes started by lightning or people. Some fires are beneficial because they release nutrients that plants need to grow. For example, some pine cones. Uh, pine cones bear seeds and they, the pine cones don't necessarily open up until it is under extreme heat like that of a forest fire. Insects. Insects cause trees to die by closing the flow of sap, killing the leaves, or rotting the wood. Remember that sap are the, the water and nutrients in plants. Aphids attack evergreens. Aphids are small bugs that suck sap from plants. They reproduce rapidly and may live in large colonies that cause extensive damage to crops. Tree disease. Tree disease can kill the tree and infect other trees nearby. Sometimes diseases are spread to other countries where nursery products are traded. Most tree diseases are caused by fungus infections. Fungal diseases clog the flow of sap, kill the leaves, and rot the wood. Okay, acid rain. So before I talk about acid rain, let's talk about the pH scale. So this is a scale that plots the pH values for acidic and alkaline substances with water being neutral right in the middle and it is a, a logarithm which you don't have to worry about right now um, but it, it basically measures the concentration of hydrogen ions the more hydrogen ions there are the more acidic it is I mean usually the cause of, of burning inside like heartburn for example is a, a result of excess hydrogen and that's why there are proton pump inhibitors because uh, hydrogen, it's, you're kind of referring to the proton, and there's medication out there called proton pump inhibitors to in inhibit or stop the output of hydrogens, which causes heartburn in the first place. Well, anyway, water is neutral. It's neither acidic nor alkaline, or basic is another term for it. So we give the value 7, and then base everything else on that. Anything below 7 
is acidic and everything above is alkaline or basic. Uh, you could think of acidic things as sour tasting, such as lemon, but basic or alkaline things are more like your, your cleaners, for example, such as the compound ammonia. And then all the way over here by zero, you have like battery acid and HCl, uh, which is hydrochloric acid. And that's what's found in stomach acid is HCl, and it's very acidic. Now, according to my years of research, and I do have a degree in chemistry, uh, you could uh, get negative pH values or pH values greater than 14, but um, a lot of things are pretty much in the scale. Now, when the scale goes from 7 uh, to 6, we are talking about a tenfold change. This is where the logarithm comes in, but you don't have to worry about that. For example, uh, 5 is not like twice as acidic as water, it means it's a hundred times acidic as water. So from seven, if we go from seven to six, then it is ten times more acidic, or ten times the amount of protons or hydrogen ions there are. Um, if you go from seven to five, it is one hundred times more acidic. If you go from nine to twelve, it is one thousand times more basic. Uh, for example. So that's the, the basics of the pH scale. Uh, what does that have to do with acid rain? Well, take a look here. Acid rain. So we're dealing with this side of the pH scale. Rain does have a pH less than 7, making it acidic. It's between 5.5 and 5.6. When we talk about acid rain, we are talking about rain that is more acidic than usual. Distilled water has a pH of 7, or neutral and normal rain has a pH of 5.6 and this is because of CO2 in the atmosphere um, you probably are familiar with the hydrologic cycle water evaporates it goes up into the atmosphere well our atmosphere contains a lot of other gases besides H2O such as CO2 nitrogen etc including uh, uh, trace elements and when the CO2 mixes with uh, water which is uh, neutral it makes it more acidic Rain with pH less than 5.6 is called acid rain, which was coined in the mid-1800s. Acid rain can fall to a pH of 3 even. So how many times more acidic is that versus water? Well, let's count. You have 10, 20, 30, 40, right? No. You have 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So it's 10,000 more acidic. Or if, if you're familiar with exponents, which you probably are by now in Adventure Rangers, um, you have 10 to the 1st, 10 to the 2nd, 10 to the 3rd, 10 to the 4th. So the exponents go 1, 2, 3, 4, but 10 to the 4th is 10,000. Acid rain forms when water vapor in the air reacts with two types of gases, sulfur dioxide, or SO2, and various nitrogen oxides, so that X could be like it could be 1, in which we wouldn't even write in the 1. It could be 2, like NO2, and such, etc. So here's an example, um, something that I adapted from Royal Rangers. So here we have the city, right here. We have man and industry, we have factories, we have, we have cars and homes. And uh, these are uh, emitting these gases, these uh, nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxides which I have uh, the structure right here along with water that's already there and these are given off and um, basically mix with the water making it acidic and so you have these clouds with quote-unquote acid rain that will uh, rain down onto the environment and again remember you have H2O mixing with CO2 making it acidic anyway with a pH of 5.6 ish around um, but these make it more acidic so if you follow you have nitric acid and sulfuric acid being formed as a result so the nitrogen oxygen mixes with water to form compounds such as nitric acid uh, water mixes with uh, SO2 to make sulfuric acid and such and then that rains down as acid rains over the forest land fields and into the streams and the lakes 
there are various ways to measure acid rain. You have the more expensive and reliable pH meter, but then you have the more unreliable uh, litmus test. So I'm not sure if you've done the litmus test, but it's the strip of paper, and when you dip it in something that's basic, or if you uh, take like a, like a dropper and you drop something on it and it is red, then that means you have an acidic uh, solution. And if it turns blue, that means you have a basic solution. Uh, these are less reliable, but they're less costly at the same time. Uh, but they're close. And there's also other, you know, um, pH uh, tests, not just red and blue, but other colors. So we talked all about acid rain, but how is it damaging to forest? Acid rain does not usually kill trees directly. It weakens trees by damaging their leaves and weakening their roots limiting the nutrients available to them, or exposing them to toxic substances slowly released in the soil. It causes slower growth, injury, or death to forest. So you could take a look at these uh, pictures right here. This is what acid rain could do. Um, it's harmful for the environment, and not just for forest, but also life. I mean, certain fish and, and other animals, it, it messes with the food chain, uh, because uh, certain animals can't eat other uh, smaller animals lower in the food chain because those other smaller animals or, or fish or, or bugs are uh, just being killed off and so um, the bigger animals get killed because there's not enough food for them and um, here, here's just a, a like a painting or an illustration of acid rain with a factory in the background that releases compounds that uh, produce acid rain Leaves and needles turn brown and fall off when they should be green and healthy. So from information gathered in the 30s and 50s, it appears that the acidity of rainfall in many places has increased significantly. Industrial factories, coal-fired power plants, and car emissions are the main sources of the gases that cause acid rain. Some scientists estimate that approximately 26 million tons of SO2, which is sulfur dioxide, and 22 million tons of the, of the nitrogen oxides were released into the atmosphere in the United States in 1980. Together, 26 million plus 22 million is 48 million tons. So together, that's 48 million tons released into the atmosphere by the United States in 1980. These are carried long distances by air currents. That's another thing uh, that I didn't add is that when acid rain forms, it could be carried several miles before it rains down. So again, these are carried long distances by air currents, so they can affect areas far from the source. One ton equals 2,000 pounds. If the average weight of the boy and Royal Rangers were 100 pounds, then doing the math, it would take 960 million, or about a billion, boys to weigh the same as this amount of air pollution of 48 million tons from back in 1980. Not all scientists think that the main cause of acid rain is human-made air pollution. Some believe that natural sources of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, such as forest fires, lightning, and volcanoes, are just as important causes of acid rain. Many soils are already acidic or contain minerals that react with rainwater, snow melt, etc. to form acids. This acidic water is carried into streams and lakes. Okay, and improper harvest. Overcutting may result in area damage because soil may be washed away during heavy rains. When the rains come, they wash away the soil and new trees cannot grow. Not balancing the harvesting and planting ratio may result in too few trees. Silviculture. This is the growing and cultivation of trees properly. It's the science of harvesting and growing crops of trees for sustained yield, or produce. Okay, the second part is tell what can be done to reduce these damages. For wildfire, set up a backfire to burn the area between the fire line and the forest fire itself. Insects. Foresters may remove old, weak trees that are easy prey for the aphids and easy targets for insects. For tree disease, 
foresters may spray the affected trees with the chemical pesticide to kill the fungus. Inspect nursery plants coming into the United States from other countries. Acid rain. Reduce air pollution from cars. Use fewer fossil fuels and drive more electric vehicles. And finally, improper harvest. Selection cutting can be used. Where small patches of mature trees are harvested, allowing room for younger trees and new growth, replant new trees, either seedlings or seeds. To ensure a constant supply of lumber, timber resources must be managed so that there is an approximate balance between the annual harvest of timber and the growth of new wood. This sustained yield is achieved by making sure that each forest has equal areas of trees that are seedlings and mature trees. Foresters know how a variety of trees grow in different climates and soils, as well as how much sunlight and water the trees require. Okay, so here are some bonus uh, merit worksheets and, and MLRs uh, resources with games, crosswords, and priceless information, uh, things that we've covered, uh, and I'm sure that if you're interested, you could go to your commander and he'll give you these. So again, there, there's crosswords and um, information that you could uh, put in your references, like on your reference shelf in your home library, and then refer to these uh, when needed or, or when you want to review. And so congratulations, you got a great start on the forestry merit. The next step is to uh, talk to your commander, do the things that you need to do at home, uh, such as the projects, and you're, you're good to go. So once again, congratulations and keep up the good work.